Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer addressing students of Dallas Theological Seminary in Lectures on the Spiritual Life. Lecture 2, Power to Overcome Evil. Subtopic number 1, The World. Our Father God, for thy wonderful care and keeping and all thy purpose for us can never change. We give thee thanks. We would learn to rest in thee completely and to draw on all thy strength and to manifest thy power and thy glory in our lives. To this end, teach us this morning in this class. For Christ's sake, amen. There are, I think, you all of you are aware, though you have not yet had the subject of soteriology, salvation truth, you are aware of the fact that there are three tenses of salvation. You were saved when you believed from the penalty of sin. You are now, as a Christian, entitled to be saved from the power of sin. As the present tense. And there is a future tense when you will be saved from the presence of sin. Now, you cannot yourself accomplish any one of these things. It is the strain upon the teacher to try to make it clear and really create the consciousness that it has to be of God. Jonah said salvation is of Jehovah, and it is from start to finish. You may go as far back as you want to, even to the eternity past when there was a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, all in the purpose of God. And that was God's plan and purpose in preparation for you. And it's nothing you did or nothing you could do. And you never do save yourself. Now, there are just two kinds of religion in the world. In one, man saves himself and in the other God saves the man. And we do not need to tell you which one is being taught in this seminary. Arminianism, held by all the branches pretty much of the Methodist Church, by the Salvation Army, by the YMCA and the YWCA and many similar organizations, follow the shallow teachings of Arminianism. And in that, when in the last analysis, it's up to the man to save himself. And if he doesn't behave, woe to him. Woe to him. Now, anybody, fellas, anybody can make a plan whereby good people can go to heaven. Any fool can make that kind of a plan whereby good people can go to heaven. It takes God to make a plan whereby bad people can go to heaven. And he's done that thing. And there is a plan for the salvation of the lost. Now there's a plan for the, for the salvation in the present tense. If I speak of the salvation plan, you know what it means that based on the death of Christ, God is able to forgive you and to make you his own. And it's all through what Christ has done on the cross. You know that. That's the plan of salvation. Now there is a plan whereby you live every day to the glory of God. And it's just as definite a plan as any plan could ever be. And you don't do it yourself. It's in the power of the Spirit. And that's what I'm straining all the time to try to make real to myself and to you. There is such a plan. Now, I move on. If you have the book before you, I pass over the introduction to the believer's responsibility. I spoke last lesson pretty much on that very thing. And we come to something else. On page 177, power to overcome evil. 
But let me say as I go now, at the bottom of the preceding page, 176, in the last little paragraph, you have one of the most important distinctions that will ever be given to you in truth. Let me read it. There is a twofold development of the spirit's word, spiritual word, spirit's work in and through the Christian, namely the negative aspect and the positive aspect. Following the present introduction, without more delay, these two aspects are we will be considered the negative, that is, overcoming evil. If you're going to be spiritual, there are two things. One is to overcome evil in your life, and the second thing is to have enablement to be good. Now there are just thousands of preachers that are getting up on Sunday and telling the people to be good, but you won't find very many of them getting up and telling them how to be good. And that's the purpose of this course, is to tell you how to do that thing. Just how to do it. What a baffling thing. Be good, be good, be good. And never, never tell you how to do it. There's a plan. And I'm trying to say that this morning. There's a plan whereby you can be more than conqueror. And you can have power in your Christian life and service. Now we come to the first is the negative side. Overcoming evil, but that's not all there is to the spiritual life. You might easily conceive this of a person who really got clear outside of ever doing a wrong thing and still would be very lacking spiritually, could be very lacking spiritually. Spirituality does not consist in what you do, don't do. It consists in what you do. And you've got just thousands of Christians over the country blown up with an unholy pride over the fact that they don't do this and they don't do that. They never go to a show. They never dance. They never play cards. Aren't they all right? It isn't a question of what you don't do, friends. It's a question of what you do that, that measures this thing. I know a city in the United States of upwards of a million. And there isn't a person in that city that ever goes to a show, or in fact there is no show in the city. And they never use tobacco or drink or play cards or dance or anything of the kind, any worldly thing. Now did you know there was a city of that size in this country? Yes, well I'm speaking about uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> They're all through, absolutely through doing evil. They're through. Now, if what, if spirituality consists in what you don't do, then a corpse has got it all. They've got it all. Now just put that down in your I didn't dare put that kind of thing in this text. <laughs> so you won't find it in the book. But I love to dwell on it just the same. No, spirituality, fellas, is not what you don't do. It's what you do. It's the output of your life. It's the character and output of your life. That's what we're after now. But we must consider this question of getting control of evil. Every Christian is fighting three battles, three simultaneous battles, one with the world and one with the flesh and one with the devil. And you can't fight a few minutes on one field and, and then give it up and run to the other. You can't do that. They're all going on at once. There's no let up anywhere. Picture yourself as standing inside of a triangle with these three fronts out here, and there's no cessation, never any let up. A warfare to the finish with the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
Now, supposing you get the victory, you learn to get the victory, I hope you may, over the world, the flesh, and the devil. In every instance, it's by faith, not by works, not by trying. You're not going to win these battles by biting your lip and clenching your fist. That's not it at all. It's by dependence upon another who is mighty. I remember how Dr. Schofield used to like to tell of an incident when he was a boy in the country and attending a country school, a little a little district school in the country. And he had to walk more than a mile after school to get home. And he said as he was going along with some of the other fellows that went the same way, there was a bigger boy that was bullying him all the time, picking on him. And he said finally he he couldn't stand it any longer. He took it up and tried to fight the big fellow. And he said he was getting the worst of it because the man was bigger than himself. And he looked up the street and saw his brother larger even than the bully coming. And he was on a run, he dropping off his coat and his jacket. And he came and he took up the fight. And young Schofield crept over to the side and got out of the way. He watched his brother do the trick as it ought to be done. <laughs> well, now... Will you turn it over to somebody else? What's the use of being mangled up and torn all to pieces in the conflict with the world, the flesh, and the devil? And never, never, never getting a victory. This is the evil I'm analyzed under these three heads. I think it's fairly complete that what we call evil is when we analyze all that's in the themes of the world and all that's in the flesh and in the devil. Now, I've taken up these three things here, and I want you to read very carefully, beginning on page 177. I'll just cover this from memory somewhat and emphasize it. Perhaps that extra will fix it in your mind better. First of all, the world, the world on page 179. The English word world is a translation of three different Greek words, at least three, sometimes four, but three different Greek words. And... Uh, in our authorized version, there's no distinguishing here. And so, as one who knows the Greek, it's your business to know what lies behind the word when you come on the word world. Uh, Forty-one times it is translated, the translation of a world age or ion or ionius. Age, a period of time, and that's in our English translation, our authorized translation, is called the world. Christ said, so shall it be in the end of the world. He wasn't talking the end of the world at all. He's talking about the end of the age, and that would happen at the end of the age of which he was speaking which is not our age at all, but that age which lapped over and has yet seven years to run in what's known as the Great Tribulation. It never was completed, and those things happen in the end of the age. Now, I could turn up much scripture here in connection with this, and that I don't think it's necessary if you just fix it in mind and very especially this whole question of the translation of that word is very is a very interesting story speaking of Schofield again after he finished the preparing
comparing the notes of the Schofield Bible, the Oxford University Press had decided to get out a 1911 edition of the authorized version, which would be an amended text, merely correcting words where there were mistranslations or changes in the use of language. And that was the most practical and useful thing that ever had been, uh, and had ever been proposed. And I'm sorry to say there isn't while well, they went ahead and got out that 1911 edition, there is not one to be had anywhere. If you should find one at any time, anywhere in a second-hand store, don't miss it. Claim it. They're worth about $25 now because they're not in print at all and not available. The Oxford Press stopped pu publishing them altogether. I have a copy which I prize very highly, which Dr. Schofield gave me with his inscription. And they looked all over the English-speaking world to find an editor-in-chief to get out that 1911 of Bible. The Oxford University did that. And they decided that Schofield was the proper man for it above anybody else. Now, when some of these modern fellows that can't think straight enough to appreciate the Schofield Bible... And some of these fellows say that Schofield had no scholarship. You take them back on that. Why did the Oxford University, with its all its divisions and presidents who determined these things, why did they select the Schofield notes for the Schofield Bible? You know, they you know, were unanimous in taking that. And why did they select Schofield to take up the editorship of this 1911, and he, he had at that time written to me from Switzerland where he was saying that when he got back to the United States uh, and his Bible was, the Schofield Bible was turned over to the printers in Oxford, then he would be going out with oral teaching going to visit all the English-speaking countries in the world. And he asked me if I'd travel with him as his associate teacher, which I promised to do. But we never got away. He came. But then he wrote me at, and said, the Oxford people have asked me to edit this Bible, 1911, he said, it'll take a year. And I'd like to postpone our program for one year. And I said, certainly, yes. And I went on teaching another year where I was in Massachusetts. Now, one thing now, the Oxford University made a condition that he should take that, but one word should not be changed. The word ion should not be changed from world to age. You'll find it always in the margin, of course, in a in a Schofield Bible or any other worthwhile uh, Bible with help, you'll find it in the margin the translation is age. And watch for that. I advise you to have the Schofield Bible if you haven't it for your study. Those notes are just invaluable. I can say to you as I go along that I hold it to be one of God's greatest gifts to the church in the last days. That's the estimation I put on it. I use it altogether. Always use it. Always have and always will, probably. So they said, don't change the word world as a translation of the of Ion, which means an age, a period of time. So shall it be in the end of the age. In the end of the age makes a great difference whether it's the world coming to an end or whether it's the age coming to an end. And you can see that at once, how it will change things. In Matthew chapter 13, you have these words piled up. The hardest is the end of the age. Now, a second use of that word, world, is to translate archimene, 
meaning the, the inhabited earth, the earth with its inhabitants, especially their institutions and their organization. The, de the devil deceives the whole or Khamenei. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout all the Archimene. And that's used 14 times. And then there's a word that's used 186 times in the New Testament. And that's the word cosmos. Cosmos. Translated world. Christ used it 19 times in that priestly prayer the night before he went to the cross. A most astonishing thing that Christ in his, uh, in his minute, in his last prayer, talking with the Father, should refer to this thing 19 times. And in the upper room discourse, some 40 times, I can't remember exactly the number of that he speaks of it. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. That's the cosmos. And the meaning of cosmos is order and uh, uh, system. The opposite to cosmos in the Greek is just the same as the opposite in English. And those two words have come over into the English language. Cosmos and chaos. Chaos. We have a great system. A great world system. And Christ said of Satan three times that he was the prince of this cosmos system. This great system of Satan, Satan's system, which he has been permitted of God to establish. How I have taken, you'll find under Satanology in volume two, one of the longest uh, portions I've written any time on this very thing. And I don't want to go over it now. I'm going to take a reproduce it all. But that material is absolutely new. I think it's just absolutely new and absolutely startling. I'm showing that the lie, the lie, which is referred to a number of times in the New Testament, not a lie or any lie, but the lie, the lie is this great cosmos system. And Satan has been permitted to establish it. That's the world, a worldly system. It has in it all its governments, its educational program, its entertainments, and very much, I want to say, men, sometime, don't you ever miss it now, sometime, you take your Greek concordance and look up every place 186 times that that word is used in the New Testament, and then find out for yourself what what is meant by the cosmos, what is meant by the cosmos in the Scripture. I am amazed beyond all words to have to point out the fact that great Bible students and hard-working men have never done that thing practically never done that thing and they just don't know and haven't haven't ever given to us in their theologies. They haven't ever given to us anything about this cosmos system, this worldly thing. When you talk about a Christian being worldly, what do you mean? What does it mean for a Christian to be worldly? Well, it means that they're turned in some respect, not from their salvation, but to the world, to this world system, perhaps for entertainment or for, in, for support or something, and they're making a place for themselves in the world. As Peter warned himself by the fire of the enemies of Christ that last night, so 
Christians will invariably, sooner or later, unless they're kept from it, will begin to warm themselves by the world's fire somewhere. And they're worldly Christians then. Doesn't I'm not saying they're lost. The governments of this world are all in the cosmos system. Oh, that's an awful thing to say. Turn to Luke chapter 4, please. Luke chapter 4. Well, we have the threefold temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Now, this temptation was a testing of his humanity, not his deity, of his humanity. Just as he had tested the first Adam, he was silly enough to try to test the, the last Adam. The first Adam was asked to disobey the plan of the Father for him, and he did it. Now he's asking the last Adam to be disobedient to the plan, to step outside of the plan and act on his own. And that's a temptation of his humanity. Beginning at verse 5, uh, it's a breathtaking thing that the devil would take him anywhere. Take him, the creator of all things. And the devil taketh him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world. Now I know here that it's not cosmos in the account by Luke, but it is in the cosmos in the account by Matthew. Here it's the Archimedes, one of the 14 times it's used. But as Matthew uses it, I'm turning to this one because it's so much more in detail. The devil said unto him, having showed him the kingdoms of the cosmos world in a moment of time, the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Yes, that's true. He wasn't saying a thing that was untrue. He's a liar, but he wasn't lying then. Had he been telling a lie, he would have been corrected for it then and there by the Son of God, but he was not. That's an awful thing, that the kingdoms of this world are in the hand of Satan. Now, I recognize also that we're enjoined to pray for our governors and our and for our those in authority over us. I do. I do recognize that, men. And in that sense, God has never really given up his plan and his hold on the destiny of things. Never. He can't do that, give up his hold on the destiny of things. Now, the world has all kinds of amusement at the glitter and tinsel and a show. You look down the street on a in a worldly city at night and see the glitter of all the signs and the invitations and open doors for entertainment. What is that entertainment? I'm going to make a statement I don't want you to misunderstand. It is this. It's the anesthetic that the world has to deaden the pain of an empty heart. They just can't live with themselves if they don't get into some kind of an amusement. They've got to have it because it's an anesthetic to deaden the pain of an empty heart. Now, don't you ever go out preaching against anesthetic. That isn't your job to take the anesthetic away from the world. Not at all. Your job is to give them something to fill the heart, and they won't want any anesthetic. I 
haven't taken any chloroform this morning myself because I haven't had any pain, any occasion to. Not at all. And I won't take it as long as I don't need it. And I'll not take worldly things if I can help it as long as I don't need it. I don't need an anesthetic to kill the pain of an empty heart. What shall we do? I'll get the life of God flowing in your life, in your heart. I have noticed, I used to see it up in New England, where we had a great many oak trees. I'd see in the spring of the year one little leaf as dead as any leaf that had ever fallen hanging on up there to the top of that tree. And it had stood there all winter against all the snow and ice and the blast that had hit it. But it is still clinging there. There's one thing that it can't endure. It'll come down in a hurry when a bud starts under it in the spring. Another bud starts there. It'll come down. And it's the explosive power, the explosive power of a new affection. And things are going to be crowded out. Worldly things are going to be crowded out, men, when the bud starts in the life and something new and worthwhile is there. Now, don't preach against worldly amusements. Don't, uh, don't do that foolish thing. That's not your job at all. And if you could get all the theaters closed today, you wouldn't have one more Christian than you have, not one. You wouldn't have any more spiritual Christians than you have, not a bit. For that doesn't, wouldn't create spirituality at all. That should be sensible, men, about these things. Are you facing this world system? And we, we must overcome it. In First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. We have a word about overcoming the world. Verse 4, but whatsoever is born of God, whosoever is born of God is really overcometh the world. Do all Christians overcome the world? No, but by their salvation they have, and they do, when they're saved. That's how it can be. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That one will be saved. Now there is such a thing as overcoming the world by the life of faith, claiming the power of God in the heart. Well, I shall not take more. I want you to read this for yourself very carefully. And may I say, men, we are upon the most foundational thing that we're going to have any time in connection with the spiritual life. And if you're going to work hard and master things, do it now in connection with the text. Get it in mind so that you can you can talk the thing backwards or forwards or up and down or start in the middle and go out both ways at once. Now second the place, 183. Here I'm reminded that I started with you last lesson on something that I didn't finish. And that was in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Where Paul divides the human family into three main divisions according to their attitude toward the word of God according to their attitude toward the word of God. And in verse 14 we read, and here you need to get your Greek Testament out and be careful, but the psychicus man, the soulish man, the natural man, 
uh, very poor translation, and perhaps there is no word in the English. I don't think there is. Why well, I said the other day that you need to go by the Greek and get more meaning out of your word, because there's more meaning to the Greek word than any English word we can put in the place of it. The unsaved, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. And I told you I wouldn't talk with that boy up in Oregon because he wasn't saved. I wouldn't talk spiritual things with him. And about nine-tenths of your argument with unsaved people is a waste of breath. Just a downright waste of breath until God reveals his truth to them. In the gospel, that's the only thing that can come to them. And they're under the requirement of God resting upon unsaved people to believe the gospel, to obey the gospel, Obey the gospel. That's the first step for every unsaved person. And you're coming right back to foundational things. It's a question of obedience again. Just as in the case of Adam and the case of Satan in the beginning. Disobedience. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because by the Spirit they are discerned and he doesn't have the Spirit. They are revealed to him and he doesn't have the Spirit. Now I go over the page in my Bible, verse 15. But he that is spiritual, who is walking and living in the Spirit, he that is spiritual, Discern it, all things. I don't say that he knows all things, but he's capable. He's in a, he's in a position to learn everything of God's truth. That man can learn the things of God. Now come to the tragedy, the beginning of chapter three. The context runs right on. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you. Remember, they're brethren now. That means they're saved. Never any, that name, brethren, is never applied to anybody but saved people in the New Testament. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, fleshly. Archicus, even as unto babes in Christ. Now they're in Christ. But don't ever make the mistake of thinking that they're immature in years. It's not a question of being babes and immature in years. A person may have been a Christian for 50 years and then be a babe in Christ because they're carnal. Carnality makes babyhood. As all Dr. Stearns, for whom this building is uh, is named and dedicated, his picture hangs there over the wall, he used to say to his congregation in Philadelphia, he'd say, hurry up now and get through with your baby talk. What baby talk? Oh, talking about belonging to this denomination and that denomination. And that's the very first thing that's named here for carnality. One saith, I am a Paul, another saith, I am a Paulus. Oh, dry up. <laughs> There's only one body. There's only one body. And Paul and Apollos may have had their share in bringing things to pass. One may plant and the other may water. But if you divide that body, that's carnality. And when Paul had to start in here to correct the Corinthian church, as he does, and later he takes up immorality, and he puts carnality ahead of immorality, and corrects it ahead of immorality. 
I'm not saying that immorality is not bad. But I'm saying that carnality is devilish. It's hellish, men. It's awful. This thing of being uh, followers after some some human leadership and saying, oh, I am a Paul. And Paul doesn't teach what Apollos does. And I don't pay attention to Apollos because I am a Paul. Now be careful. You can do that and be following so great a man as Calvin. There are all kinds of leaders in the world, you know. Mary Baker Eddy is one of them. I could not speak to you as spiritual, but as babes in Christ, and I have fed you with milk. And so the pastor has to go around with a bottle and spoon and do a lot of few drops of milk here and there to get along with his carnal church members. Just absolutely carnal. Now take those three divisions and you have one of them has to do with the place. The fleshly, unsaved man and the carnal man is the man who is walking after the flesh. If by the Spirit you are walking, if by means of the Spirit, depending upon Him, you are walking, ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a tremendous promise. Galatians 5, 16. Ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And every one of you have the flesh. Every one of you have the flesh in you. I don't deny that because that won't do. Of course you have the flesh. And of course it's got to be considered and overcome. And I've given you the passage that if by means of the spirit you are walking, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Let's turn to that passage in Galatians chapter 5. I shall be back on all of these passages more or less later as we get on in this course. And verse 16, This I say then, walk by means of the Spirit. When it says walk in the Spirit, it sounds as though it meant that you could do it if you tried. But you can't do that, man. You can't do that. And you're not told to do it. The real meaning of the words here is walk in dependence upon the Spirit. I told you last time of how Trotter, how young there is in Charlotte, Trotter learned by to let the Spirit live his life. He learned that simple thing. And then he was so afraid he was going to lose it, you know. Verse 17. For the flesh desires are lusted against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary the one to the other. They never will pull together. Don't you sit around and dream of a day and sometime you're going to put this thing out and get it so that you've got a, you've got a match team between the spirit and the flesh. You can't do it. I don't know what experience you've had handling horses, but you know that it's a great thing to get a pair of horses that will pull together. I used to do a great deal of that as a boy. I had much to do with it. And we take a young, a young colt, you know, uh, didn't know anything, just a crazy young colt, and, and hits him in beside a sober old horse, hoping that he'd get some hint or suggestion from the decorum of the old horse, but he wouldn't do it at all. He'd be on his front feet and then on his hind feet and finally come down over the pole of the wagon and everything tangled up. Oh, yes, you can't, 
you can't pull you can't pull anything by matching up the spirit and the place. They never they're contrary the one to the other. Everything of the flesh that's in you is enmity toward God, Paul said in Romans eight. The flesh is enmity toward God. Everything in you that's flesh is enmity and is contrary to the spirit. But is it there? Yes, it's there, man. It's there. I don't try to make yourself think that just because you're saved it isn't there. Of course it's there. You've got this theory that goes with modern holiness movements. And that is that you can tarry long enough and sometime have, sometime have an eradication. Eradication of, this, of the sin nature. It never was eradicated in the world. It can't be eradicated. Eradication, to say earlier with you men, you can't take a nature out of anybody. You can't get a nature out. It just can't be. The day's coming when you leave that all behind with the body. When you leave this body and go to another body, you, you'll leave the flesh behind. But until then, you've got the thing to fight. I don't doubt it, you've got the thing to fight. I'm 77 years old, and I can tell you now that the fight is bigger than it ever was, as far as I can see. It doesn't grow less and less as I get, take on better habits and more experience in life. It doesn't grow less. It grows harder and worse all the time. Over in Louisville, Kentucky, there was an old man dying, a very godly old man, who had been a professor all his life in a seminary there. And one of his colleagues went into the room to see him on a little pastoral call, and the dying old man said, oh, he said, I'm so anxious to go. I want to go. And his friend said to him, why do you want to go? Oh, he said, I'm so tired of fighting sin. I'm so tired of fighting sin. Now you remember that, man. That's what's going to be in your life. If you live to an old age, you'll get tired if you fight sin. And still you'll fight it. And still you'll fight it. And the sin nature is there out of which the whole thing comes. It's always there. Now supposing a young man and a young girl who, according to the satisfaction of these cults have been eradicated, have had their natures eradicating sports, and they're married. And in due time, a child is born. Will that child have a sin nature? Are they able to generate a child without a sin nature? They should if they've lost their sin nature, but they won't. You'd be just as big a little brat and devil as any of them ever was. Just as big. Don't you doubt it now. They'll have just as much trouble with him, and he'll he'll be just as much a sinner as anybody else. Why? Because they didn't lose their sin nature. There is no such thing. And the flesh is with you to the day of your death, man. It's with you. It's with you. And you've got to shape yourself to finding how to get along and how to get victory over it. That I shall have to have much more to say about later. We're dismissed for the morning. Please read these things carefully, man.